So this is our show called Means of Creation, where we're talking about the passion economy and the future of work and the creator economy. And today we're joined by our special guest, Turner Novak. He is a angel investor, meme creator, TikTok influencer, micro influencer. Um, <laughs> what a burn, <laughs> micro influencer. Wait, Come on, be- what? <laughs> I have like 50,000 50, something, isn't that like a micro influencer? I was trying oh, to wow. be precise, but I realized I shouldn't have. Um, Her's going to no, storm okay. out. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think of myself as an influencer. I like, so I'm okay that I get the low. Sometimes the, the we low, do low. actually really interview real. Okay. I'm just going to stop talking. <laughs> no, it's okay. You don't think I'm a real influencer. I get it. Turner, you have a lot of influence on me. I'll just speaking personally. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Lee doesn't listen to what I say. She doesn't care. She's like, eh. She's kind of funny, but he doesn't influence me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Let's, All right, let's Lee, reset you, the room. Um, yeah, let's reset the room. <laughs> Turner's awesome, despite everything I've said so far. <laughs> Why are you doing the intro? We should have had Nathan do it. Um well, okay. So moving on past everything that I've said already, um, he also writes really thoughtful long form blog posts and he is a former GP at Gelt VC working on something new. And, um, yeah, he's just really deeply insightful about consumer technology, social creators. And so we're really excited to have him on the show. So thank you so much Turner for being here today. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm glad I made the cut. (laughs) Um, Okay. So first I wanted to start with the, the story about Substack. Um, I mean, it's not really anything new that's happened. It's a program that has been in existence for a while, I believe called Substack Pro, but recently it came to light because Hamish wrote a piece um, about why we pay writers. I think that was the name of the piece. And just really since then, uh, there's been a lot of strong opinions on both sides about this program. Um, And to summarize, essentially Substack has hand-selected a number of writers um, for whom they grant advances. And it's meant to be a stipend that replaces their income for the first year that they're on the platform. And then after that time is over, they move over to the regular revenue sharing program. And I think to summarize a lot of the feelings about this program, um, the criticisms are basically that it's it's opaque. It's They haven't disclosed who's actually being who's actually in this program, who Substack is paying. Um, There's questions over how much is Substack exercising some sort of editorial strategy here um, and supporting financially these creators who may be quite controversial. Um, But I think in the piece that that the team published last week defending the program, um, they really framed it as they try to make an effort to make the selection of the writers quite diverse. Um, and it is ultimately aimed at supporting the creative ecosystem and supporting writers who would otherwise have difficulty in transitioning to this model. So wanted to discuss that with you guys tonight and then we can discuss all sorts of other topics, but we'll start with that. I think you had a really interesting point on it when we kind of brought this up earlier on Monday forget the, the law or the rule, section 230 or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was that again, specifically? Oh, yeah. Well, well, section 230 is basically the law that says, if you're an internet service, like back in the day when it was written, I think it was like forums were like the big way that people communicated on the internet, that for, forums weren't liable for content that their users published in the same way that like a magazine was, an, an article that they published. And the thinking was that, Basically, there's zero marginal cost to host content. People are just submitting stuff. Like you don't really know what's going on. Your cost structure just doesn't work if you have to be liable for communication platform. And, and it has different economic dynamics than than publications that you know and invest a lot of scarce sort of like shelf space and time and money into like and they pay for something in order for the content to exist. There's kind of like a difference there, um, and that's that's been under you know kind of. It's been in question. It's been volatile lately. What what the future of that will be? Obviously, the Trump administration was kind of like wanting to basically they arguing that there is bias against conservative viewpoints and wanting to use that. But there's a lot of questions about how 
I mean, platforms should, it seems like there's this tricky thing, which is like, yeah, there's a lot of really terrible stuff that happens on platforms that I think everyone that's not, that's a non-controversial statement. And so mm-hmm. what responsibility do platforms have? And like, it's funny. Cause we've been talking about, I think, you know, for most of the Trump era, the responsibility to like remove content or users. And then here we're kind of in this interesting flip scenario where it's like, well, Substack is investing in creators and they're not really like editing them. And, you know, they're not like approving or rejecting posts, you know, before they go out, yep. but they are financially investing in them. And it feels a little bit different and closer to a publication, but it's just different. It is different, but it is closer. And so it's like, it's, it's interesting. Like how, how should, what should the new like norms be and mores be around and, and accepted standards be around this kind of stuff and maybe laws, you know, like how do laws change because of this? Yeah. I've always kind of thought of it as like a growth thing mm-hmm. because like if you, if you get a really high profile writer, you're, you're paying them or you help support them, get them off their feet and make the jump from a publication and saying, Hey, publish on our platform. If you get the right people, they're like, Hey, I'm using Substack. Come read my Substack. All of their writer friends, all of their friends in the same industry will also see it. And they'll be like, Oh, Substack looks cool. I'll use it too for my independent business. So it, like in a way it's like a pretty effective way to like kind of market and grow the product. So that's what I kind of thought initially. That's probably why they're doing it is like oh, get totally. the right people on board. And like, so it's like, they probably didn't come into it saying let's get certain viewpoints on here and, and influence how people are thinking about things. But to an extent, like they did actually choose who they brought on. So you could probably argue that, yeah, they are influencing certain things in a certain way. I don't know. Yeah, totally. It's weird because it's like a lower bar than like we agree with what they publish, which is kind of the stance that a publication has. But it's a higher bar than we'll not kick them off the platform that they could self-serve, like walk in the front door. So you know what I mean? Like it feels like there is to some degree an endorsement, maybe not like personally, politically for the team members or whatever, but like just that it's a good thing that should exist in the world in some way and like has merit. It's like, how could you not? How, like, how could you write a check for like hundreds of thousands of bucks to someone if you felt like they were causing net harm in the world? You know, like you probably would, you would find it distasteful and you probably wouldn't. So it's really tricky. I don't, I don't like think there's an easy answer to it, but for sure it originated as a growth thing. Like you said, where it's just like, yeah, we want to get great writers on the platform. And a lot of the most yeah. interesting writing is controversial. I think that a lot of the folks who are upset with the program are upset because it's just not transparent and they are refusing basically to publish the list of the writers who were selected for Substack Pro. Um, oh, and they I never think, actually published it? Mm-mm. No, it's, oh, it's, interesting. it's okay. still not clear who is in the program and people can sort of guess based on how high profile of a job they had before um, and things like that, but it's it hasn't ever been published. And I think that is definitely a valid concern because if I, Nathan, to use your analogy of like, they're, they're funding these people, they're providing the seed capital. I mean, investors try to be transparent to potential companies when they meet with them as to who their current portfolio companies are, because that can actually impact the decisions that you make and the conversations that you have. Um, And just as publishers often, they, they will explicitly label a piece as being from a contributor versus from one of their own writers. I think in this case, um, like it feels very similar to me. Like these writers are essentially being paid a salary by Substack for the first year. Um, And so they are indirectly supporting the existence of this content. Totally. I've just shocked like everyone into silence. Yeah, I know, right? No, it's like degrees of support, you know? Like anyone who uses your platform, you're like supporting them in some way because there's your software does a job for them. And so it helps the thing exist. Um, and then like, but that's like not very scarce. Like the marginal cost of one extra person using the platform is zero for Substack. And but cash is like, I think there's something about like what's the what are the principles that could like determine how we handle these things going forward, given that it's not exactly a publisher, but it's also operating differently from a traditional, like, you know, whatever, totally hands-off platform. It's like uh, something about the scarcity of the level of support or the marginal cost 
the amount of the size of the bet you're making kind of on the person. It's like, there's, there's something about that, that like matters and, and creates like a closer tie, I think between mm-hmm. the creator and the company. It's interesting too, a Substack cause it's like writing is just so inherently like when you're dealing in the world of ideas, they're like powerful and dangerous and like, you know, entertainment platforms, I think face some of this, but it's probably a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, if it's like it's more like lighthearted, know. I guess like Substack, it's like some hard hitting stuff. Like we're, we're reporting things that you really want to read versus maybe like TikTok. It's like entertainment. What's right? happening? Oh, wait, sorry, Turner. I think you're muted maybe on, tw- on Twitter spaces. Sorry. Cause I can see you on our zoom. <laughs> oh, sorry. you're right. I was. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was so confused and Lee didn't say anything. So I thought it was just me, but sorry, Turner, keep going. Well, I think it's kind of like, I feel like when you're talking about other platforms, like, like Instagram or TikTok, like it's just a video, like someone did something funny or like, right. like a, per, like a beautiful person's like, like do like making something, whatever versus with Substack, It's like, this is like some hard hitting analysis. Like I'm reporting something, like I'm breaking something that people want to know. So it can kind of like, maybe it's like, you really do have to take that stuff seriously versus like, yeah, uh, it's just like a picture from Justin Bieber or something like who cares. Right. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's a little bit, I think it's a little bit easier for like, it, it's interesting. Cause um, you know, Snapchat is paying creators who submit to spotlight and like yep. ha- there hasn't really been, I'm sure they've paid out orders of magnitude more money than Substack has yeah, <laughs> total a million a day. I don't know. I mean, Substack's probably paid a couple million, maybe, I don't know, just based on wild conjecture. I have no inside information into this. Also, I should disclose. I used to work at Substack in case no one knows who's listening. Um, but I haven't worked there in over, I don't know, like two years, I think now almost. So I don't, there's a lot that I don't know anymore. Um, but yeah, basically like, um, I haven't heard anything like this about like Snapchat doesn't have any transparency, I think, into who they pay. Right. I feel like some. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like people Although say people if they typically, got money. Right. They're very public because it's a <laughs> yeah. celebratory yeah. moment. But yeah, I think you're right because the, the other analogy that I was going to make is like whenever the social companies launch a new feature, like reels, usually there are deals that happen with creators and they get paid for posting on that new feature. Um, But there hasn't really been an outcry about, you know, who's getting paid to do reels or to go on IGTV or anything like that to the same extent that there is this backlash over Substack Pro. And I think Turner, to your point, it is because like the written content that's on Substack is just so much more dense and, like people have strong, it elicits strong opinions. Um, and knowledge they, is power and power is dangerous, mm-hmm. you know? Right. It doesn't feel lighthearted kind of like throwaway content. It's stuff that really yeah. influences a lot of people's thinking. Yeah, like VC thought leadership. I mean, that super it changes the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. None yeah, of us I, are getting paid by Substack, by the way. I know. Um, Yeah, what are we doing with our lives? Well, I mean, every used to be on Substack, so we were getting paid through Substack, um, and and I did receive a salary when I was an employee. (laughs) So it's it's worth noting, just in the spirit of full transparency. um, But yeah, no, I um, I think I think it's really interesting how um, I don't know, like it's just a new thing, and 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 I get it's like a really important thing, and it feels kind of like a bummer when. Um, it can't be treated like, Hey, this is like a complex new thing, you know? And like, it's not obvious, like what the right thing to do is in the same way that like, like standards that have been around for a long time in other fields are like, you know, um, it's like, it's, it's like you, you, you have established patterns and those patterns actually are built off of the way that like technologies work almost. And so you, you develop social norms, like on top of that. And like, technology's changed and the social norms are like thrashing around right now, basically. And we're trying to figure it out. Um, like, I think it's, I think it's kind of reasonable that when Substack started doing this, like that they didn't disclose it. Cause it was just an experiment. Like you don't want to announce a program that you don't know if you're going to keep doing or if it even works or makes sense, you know? Um, and um, at what point do you announce it? Like, I, I don't know, like it, it, there's no, like, it's, it's a little bit tricky. I think, I think it is important though. I do agree that like, I think it makes sense for it to be like a public thing. Of course, you don't mm-hmm. want to like publish it without the consent of the writers. Cause if you did a deal with the writer and the idea was that it was like a private 
it was a confidential sort of like business transaction and then you publish it without their consent then like that's bad but also it feels kind of like it is nice for for people to know kind of like who's in the program because I think pe people have the right to like sort of make their decisions about what businesses they want to do business with based on their values and if someone doesn't like the decision Substack is making like that's good and I don't think Substack really is the kind of company that like wants to hide behind that like the the post that um they wrote about their stance on content moderation they've been pretty straightforward about like here's what we are and if you like it we're for you and if you don't we get it but this is just our philosophy you know so i think it goes alongside that to disclose who it's like yeah. here's who we fund and if you like it awesome if you don't then we get it like there's other places to go it's interesting though that the approach that they've taken towards towards substack pro is so different from the clubhouse accelerator mm the Clubhouse Creator First Accelerator Program, which I think just got announced last week, um, where they're selecting 20 creators and helping them to like build their audiences, partner with brands, monetize their shows. And that one has like an open application. There's a type form that's going around. Presumably the people who are selected will probably get publicized given that it was an open application. It feels like the end outcome of this program is probably going to look similar to what Substack Pro has been, which is like they help creators get off the ground. But it's just interesting that they have taken such different paths to get there. Totally. And the response to Clubhouse's Creator First program, by the way, was like super positive. That was my impression. Um, and I think it is positive because it's been framed that way and it's it feels very open to all. I feel like part of it too could be like clubhouse isn't really battling against any like incumbent audio publications or products necessarily in the same sense that Substack is basically saying like we're unbundling every newspaper and like <laughs> a lot of people don't like that yeah so it's almost like easier to get really really upset about it too like i wonder if there's certain if there's there's probably like a lot of legal regulatory stuff like related to being employed in that industry or something like i i have no idea what they are but i yeah. they, they could probably get you could probably pick a bunch of stuff apart that they're you know they're not treating journalists fairly or something like not compensating them the right way compared to how you should if you were at like a union publication or something i don't even know if that's a real thing but it yeah. feels like that could be a case yeah totally well a lot of that stuff as far as I understand it with journalism is really based on norms like ethics disclosures and all that kind of stuff. There's not really very many laws around that kind of thing. Cause it's hard to enforce. And it's like, yeah, it gets really, it gets really slippery, but I do think yeah. that there's like a set of standards that, you know, leaders of these, of these newsletters and or newspapers, you know, <laughs> and, and publications. And uh, it's funny to think of the New York times as like a newsletter, you know, but it is just a piece of paper that gets mailed to people in this, in the way, but it's like a whole institution and a set of practices and a history and stuff. But at the end of the day, the surface area is similar. Um, but anyway, the um, it's obviously not just a sheet of paper. It's a website too. Um, but, um, and an app, but um, the, um, the set of standards that have evolved around that are like, I think really important. Just there's this whole, like when you go to journalism school, I, I don't know, cause I haven't been, but there's a ton of stuff you learn. And I'm starting to learn a lot of it just cause of every, like what I do now. Um, but I think a lot of readers take it for granted, you know? And this was, there was a thread like a month or ish ago where basically there's like a journalism professor, I forget her name, um, saying like, no one should read Substack. No one should, no one should subscribe or pay for anyone or like, don't start a sub stack. Don't pay for any sub stacks because I, remember she, that. She, her, I think her worry was basically like all the standards that exist in traditional newsroom environments, like don't exist on sub stack. And it's going to make the world a worse place. It, Cause like when power sort of devolves from those places, the other, the new people who have the power, like probably won't use it or cause they just are like, I don't know. It's interesting. Cause it's kind of like social media versus like, TV or something. TV was like more concentrated and more prescribed and the content was more like down the middle and social media, you got a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff, you know, yeah. of varying, varying quality to put it lightly. I'm curious what you think about that. You, Cause it sounds like you're, you thought you saw that thread and you had thoughts. Uh, I don't even totally remember what it was. I just, I do remember thinking like, <laughs> I gotta be careful what I say. I remember thinking like, eh, this is maybe like a little bit 
a little bit much old old industry but it was right. like a good point so that's that's what i'll say <laughs> yeah it's tricky it's like if the upshot is it's unethical to pay for any sub stack it's like okay like but like um there is there is a point about journalistic standards i mean certainly is at every point that like the content should just not exist or that we shouldn't pay for it or like i mean blogging has been around for a long time Right. That is a good yeah, point. Exactly. Blogging has been around for a long time. And a lot of really valuable voices have come out of blogging that wouldn't have been granted entry into, you know, by the gatekeepers or whatever into the public sphere. And and so, you know, that's that's, that's right. It point. seems like she's saying that we could do this activity for free. We're just not allowed to make money from it. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> right. Be. That is actually I don't hundred percent remember. It was a couple, it was like a month ago. So I also did not read this thread, so I'm just totally interpreting based off of what you said. Probably yeah, it's probably a good guess though, to be honest. Yeah. I think I think the key thing about the money there is um, you know, if people are just doing it for free, then not that many people are doing it, and it's not probably having that much influence or impact. But once people start doing it for money and there becomes an economy built out of it, it becomes more of a force in society. And so mm-hmm. it's less that it's some, you know, people shouldn't be allowed to make money. And it's more, if people are making money, then they're probably operating with a greater degree of importance in the world overall as like a system. Cause there's an economy around it and people get serious about it and specialize and grow. Yeah. It's so interesting much. because I think the, I mean, the original like raison d'etre of Substack is that like the business model of advertising was not sufficient to support thoughtful writing mm-hmm. and content that was nuanced and like was of a higher caliber um, that would actually be nutritious for people to consume. And by implementing this business model of a subscription newsletter, like we could actually have more thoughtful voices out there being able to publish on a consistent basis. And so it feels like the argument she's making is similar to the argument that Substack made as to why it should even exist. Yeah. Versus the free content that is ad-based is was like made to accrue as many views and clicks as possible. It is an interesting counterpoint. It kind of makes me, it kind of makes me think about when you think about like different, like different industries being threatened by anyone being able to make money on the internet, doing something and not going through the, like the traditional gatekeepers like what other kind of reactions we might see to other platforms that help other creators earn money online versus going through the old way of doing things. Like if we'll see any kind of interesting kind of pushback on some of those things, I don't know. I haven't really thought too much about that. Just a meta comment about Twitter spaces. There are so many faces and people in here that I would never see on clubhouse. It's like a whole different different universe. Different crew. Yeah. It's a different crowd. I see you guys. It looks like somebody said we're having, there's a lot of bleeps and dings app noises that are really distracting. Oh, really? That's only if you minimize the thing. If you keep it open, you won't hear that, I think. Oh, so that's like a feature. Because I haven't heard any bleeps or dings. And so it's like a Twitter spaces feature where it's like sound, like audio UI kind of a thing. I think it's the sound of people coming in and out. Wait, oh, so I like, just heard it. Yeah. I'm in the uh, feed now. I'm not in the actual room. Interesting. And you're hearing people coming and going. Ooh, that would be. Uh, yeah, sick. I have no idea. Yeah, it was like a little like blip. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Twitter spaces. Turn that off. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it can be useful if you're having like a small conversation. Yeah. But not with 140 people. Yeah, totally. Too much churn. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, we How should probably decrease churn and format? get back on topic. <laughs> I would love to see like emoji reactions from the crew as to like, do they like Twitter spaces or not? Or Clubhouse. Oh yeah, Twitter, Twitter spaces. The thing is though, all the emojis are positive. So Let's there's make- no way for people to communicate negatively. You know? A hundred if you like Twitter spaces, laugh, crying laughing face if you don't like Twitter spaces and you think we should just be And you would like to, yeah. Laughing, crying for Clubhouse. <laughs> I am seeing a lot of Oh, hundreds. we're getting some laughing, crying. Okay, so I've been crying. Uh, there we go. It's impossible to to please everyone. Someone needs to make a uh, a back end where you record on one and it just shoots you to Twitter Spaces, to Clubhouse, to Instagram Spaces, to Facebook I know, right? Spaces. 
We need we need syndication technologies. It's like when you you know the press conferences where someone's got like eight microphones in front of them. It's like we just <laughs> yeah. we just need we that. Have four different phones <laughs> for the internet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is what the internet needs right now. Uh, okay, this is good. This is good. I enjoyed our, I enjoyed our chat about um, Substack. There was a thought that I had at the end that I just wanted to throw out, which is like. When you, get, when you create these sort of platforms and you give people a lot of power and especially they start to grow audiences and especially if they don't have a lot of experience, kind of like maybe they haven't internalized some of the norms or culture that like are basically ethics based, you know, where it's like mm -hmm. the reason we do it this way isn't because it's good for us. It's because it's good for other people. But we've learned over time that it's better to do that, that you end up with situations where people can harm other people. And I, I whose responsibility is it Cause like, do you expect new people coming in who don't know anything to like know any better? It feels sort of like you could expect some situations where people will just screw it up. And like, so who teaches them? Does the platform teach them? Like, it, is there some mechanism for, I mean, I don't know, just like overall there's like discourse. So someone could write a post saying they think this is bad or whatever, but like think about YouTube or like Vine or people do so much dumb stuff on there that like harms them or harms other people. That's like, they're motivated. It's like, do it for the vine. You know, that was like the old thing that people used <laughs> yeah. to say. Y'all remember? Like, yeah. it's like, they're really motivated by this force, this like network that's come into their life and this belief that they can use it to like, you know, gain clout basically. Um, yeah. And so it's creating a new incentive, but it's not, it's not kind of guiding the incentive in any particular way. And so there's some kind of like chaos that results from that. It just feels like a general purpose mm -hmm. thing. And I'm curious if y'all have any, like, do you agree? Do you have solutions? I don't know. Yeah, there was a really cool tweet the other day. I'm totally blanking on who wrote it. Um, but basically, like, the internet lacks any sort of negative feedback action. Mm. Like, we can't dislike posts. We can only like them or move on. And therefore, you never get any sort of constructive feedback on, like, you know, maybe this tweet was not the best and, like, you, you could it. reframe <laughs> yeah, exactly. Instead, people just ignore. Right. So there's like, as, as a creator, you don't get that kind of negative feedback from people. You just get ignored. Um, and I think that makes it difficult for people to have a, a closed feedback loop where they can get feedback and improve on their work. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, because I know people were protesting, like requesting a Facebook dislike button like for like the last like 12 years. Right. And they never added it. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that just like hijacks the conversation. I feel like I've seen things like negative discussions or anything like that isn't perceived as being happy or positive. It has like a certain times more impact than positive mm -hmm. types of things. So they like, like the best thing to do is just like, just cut them out and just like not reinforce it or something. Maybe that could be part of it. Yeah. I almost feel like, I don't know if most creators would be able to interpret negative feedback in any sort of way that's like constructive. Cause like, I think what you really need in that situation is like a mentor slash coach to be like that in it. But like, here's, what is yeah. it, you know, <laughs> like, and you're okay. Like we all make mistakes and like that kind of stuff. And like, that takes a human relationship kind of. And I honestly wonder if there should be more like, like, and this is to Substax credit, something that they've, they've done is put together a mentor program. Um, and and it feels like the best way to do it. Yeah, totally. Where it's like, it is scalable. It is human. And, but it's sort of like, what if it was like, you know how clubhouse, like everyone has like a parent and grandparent and great grandparent or whatever. Um, except like Paul and Rohan, who I guess are gods. Um, <laughs> Where there's like, because everyone had to have an invite, right? And it shows you oh, on the family yeah. tree. I guess Paul and Rohan are like Adam and Eve. Um, but like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, anyway, the, um, it would be cool if like, you know, to like get an acceptance into some sort of like creator program, like, you know, in Twitch, it's like the partner program where you can make money or with like Snapchat at Spotlight. It's like, here's the, here's the creator section of this rather than being a regular user. Like to get into that, what if you had to like have a, like a mentor or something and you can still create content. Like you could still tweet, you could still post videos, whatever you could still post posts, but like, there's sort of like a, a little bit of a gate. That's just like literally someone kind of needs to be responsible for you in some way and like take you under their wing. 
it was extremely slow growth though it's like totally impractical but <laughs> yeah i feel like you're running into the issue of like the people only take people under their wing that they identify with or are like yeah closely aligned with so it's like it's really hard for other people to like break through that aren't in the traditional kind of industry or yeah you'd have to really do a, or you'd have to do a great job yeah. seeding it to make sure you'd have to really carefully manage that yeah and that would just yeah. be a hassle <laughs> and it would probably limit growth so i get why i get why it's <laughs> probably not the most practical idea but it feels like you know like i kind of it's weird like starting like a media company i i feel like it's really important like seeking out mentors who like have worked in this before and like understand not just pra- practical things of like how to succeed but also like yeah just ethical things or 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 just like norms and moral standards or whatever i don't know it feels like there's those things kind of go hand in hand like they're both valuable i don't know and like how we pass them down is just so different now because the gates are wide open that's like the big difference between after like after internet and pre-internet world is like the gates are wide open now so all Mm -hmm. those sort of mechanisms we had where people had to go through a specific channel you know or like everyone already has a channel and things emerge like in this sort of organic way or whatever. Good point. By the way, someone just DM'd me that you can turn off the sound effects. Oh, I'm like clicking, as a room moderator? I think just for yourself. Oh, okay. um, on the three dots, adjust settings, sound effects. I, uh, I am again on a different version and don't have that. What? Wow. Yeah. Mine mine just says it's a transcription. So I can view or turn off transcriptions. That's it. That's the only setting. Oh my gosh, the I transcriptions have. work. This Where is do you the see transcriptions work? You just you turn on captions and, and it's captioning the conversation in real time. Okay. Interesting. I turn on view captions. Oh wow, that's weird. <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> it's kind of distracting if you're talking looking at them you're like watching the caption from what you said three seconds ago (laughs) yeah that is the weirdest experience i've ever had in my life watching a caption of what i just said i'm just having my brain melt right now sorry everyone (laughs) (laughs) um awesome well now that we've talked about substack and captions for for 40 minutes yeah, I'm curious, is there anything that's on your mind lately about like just sort of like the creator economy or like the different platforms? I'm just curious what you're what you're interested in these days because I'm always such an avid reader of your tweets, both the the meme and serious uh, ones. So we can go in either direction, yeah. but I'm just curious what's on your mind these days. Yeah, um, I, I definitely have not said as many like serious types of things. My ratio of not taking Twitter as seriously to taking it seriously has been a lot in the lower, higher. I don't know what the right thing to say is there over the last probably six or seven months. I've just had other things I've been trying to work on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the one thing that's super interesting that I, I talked when we were talking Monday that I kind of mentioned was like this whole like controlling distribution. So yeah. if you just think about like Twitter as like a like information distribution channel, whatever. I mean, you open Twitter and it's giving you tweets, just like written content, videos, people are linking to podcasts, linking to newsletters, um, linking to clubhouse rooms. Twitter's kind of making moves to like capture that value. Yeah. And then the thing that I think was so interesting that Twitter did like a couple of years ago was switch the feed from just being people that you follow to also being algorithmic. So like if you like rip off a really good tweet and like people like it and like, you know, it gets a lot of activity, like the retweets don't really matter. Mm. It's just if enough people that you are kind of in your network are interacting with tweet, a lot of other people are going to see it. So it's, it's similar to TikTok in that sense. It's not quite the same, Mm. but it's like, if you are really like a good creator of like, whatever that content is, it's more likely that people will see it. Like, it's kind of like TikTok at the one end of the spectrum is like extremely algorithmic Mm. at the complete other end. It's like a Facebook or an Instagram newsfeed where it's like only your follower graph. Yeah. And then Twitter's kind of in the middle now, I guess. And maybe Clubhouse is too. Like Clubhouse is kind of algorithmic, but it's also sort of who you follow. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I've always been like, wow, like Twitter had all this potential to do all the stuff they're doing like for the last 10 years. And they started doing it recently, which is like 
it's it's awesome to see them making moves but it's also like like you just don't know like they've kind of tried to do stuff like this in the past and then just nothing's happened so yeah i'm always a little bit hesitant of like really buying into it because they've just kind of let us down a couple times already um so. Yeah, but judging by their execution here, just like using Twitter spaces right now, something seems to have palpably changed. Would you agree oh, yeah. with that? Like, it, they seem to have hit their groove and they're just shipping really quickly. And like, I think they have seen that there's such a huge opportunity for them to not just be the top of funnel where creators are building an audience and engaging people, um, but then like leaving the other platforms to suck up all of the value from that. I think they're seeing the opportunity that they have to capture the value on platform within their own ecosystem as well. And they seem to be executing quite well in that direction. Yeah. Cause I think the beauty of, and like what makes any internet business valuable is just like controlling that end demand with the customer, like yeah. whether it's B2B or consumer. And like, I mean, that's why Facebook is a, I don't know what it's trading at like $800 billion company. Cause it just like, essentially dictates how like a couple billion people run their lives and like use their phones. Yeah, totally. So if you have a, so if you have a product like a Twitter or potentially a clubhouse where it's like you open clubhouse and your intent is like, you know, I'm using it every night. I'm going, I'm finding things to do. You know, if you fast forward 10 years is clubhouse only audio rooms. I don't know. Probably not. Like they're probably gonna have to add more things, but it's just like a, it's like, it's like owning that lock screen on your phone. Like that four things on kind of your dock bar where you've got yeah, like totally. those the apps you use all the time. It's just like, if you can be one of those apps and just like be the someone's entry point into accessing the internet, like it's just so strategic. And then you kind of figure out, okay, how do we make money? How do we like, you know, help the people using our platform make money? Um, so I think Twitter is in like such an interesting spot. And to your point, Lee, like they've definitely, this is like the best shot that they've ever taken. Like, they're yeah. executing pretty well and it's like oh it's actually you know it's all working like they haven't fumbled it yet so totally i think of it like a russian nesting doll or whatever where it's like but instead of just mm-hmm. like one layer that gets smaller and smaller it's like each layer is really complex and has a lot of different sub layers but it's like the higher order of a habit you own the more valuable you are so like what's the highest order it's like the phone itself the physical device right <laughs> and like the operating system that powers it it's like incredibly sticky it's really important it runs everything else and then within that yeah it's like your doc it's like what are your key things it's like email it's like so much of your life runs on like email or like what messaging apps you use or like what are your kind of like top order habits like you know twitter or facebook or instagram or tiktok or whichever one it one it is that you're kind of like habitually going to and like what you're looking to for it from and then within that there's like accounts that you really like that's like oh i like it when i get an email from this person or when i see this person's tweets or whatever and it's kind of like the value gets sort of like thinner and thinner as you get like f- smaller in the Russian doll world. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's, that's a good analogy. At least I get it. <laughs> Hopefully everybody else does. Well, the thing I've always Lee thought. Is I neutral. Lee, this. I'm like, what? Did, <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the thing I think is really interesting about clubhouse is like, if you've ever tried to launch and grow a podcast, you don't just pick up your phone and be like start room and you like start recording your podcast there's so many other things you have to do clubhouse literally makes it where it's like you just launch a like a podcast quote unquote it's not quite the same thing but you're literally doing it from your phone so and like and it's it's ironic because for most podcasts they're not recording them on your phone you're like recording it on your computer you've got like a fancy mic etc like we're literally recording this right now on zoom and somebody will probably use some program to edit it. But Clubhouse is literally like launch a business, like an audio based business from your All phone. One. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like kind of compelling for certain people. Like, and I personally think I'd be terrible at doing like a weekly interesting audio based show. Right. But there's like some people, like I've been in some rooms on there. I was like, man, I would totally pay money to listen to this and support them. And it makes it super easy. And like, if you can, figure out how you analyze the content in the rooms and figure out like, wow, this show is crushing it. We got to source it higher in the feed for more people to see. And like, you know, there's probably a lot they have to figure out there, but it's basically, you make Clubhouse place, you open it up and it's just like discovering interesting content. And like, and that's the thing, like if they can make it so that somebody's first time using it, they're like, holy crap, like 
this means of creation show like this is awesome like i'm gonna tune in i'm gonna pay like they'll keep coming back every time so yeah um it's like a dance like how do you figure that out and that's probably why they just raised a bunch of money because like yep we're gonna try to figure it out i think the key thing is just quality of audience kind of and creators it's just like who's there and like what people will listen to me if i show up there and that's why it's so interesting Lee, what you said earlier about like um you know, so we've 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 now held the show in three places. We've had it live on Zoom, where we invite everyone to a Zoom link. We've had it on Clubhouse, and we've had it here. And it's a little bit different every time. Like, not just how many people show up or how it feels, but like who shows up. And it's just so fascinating. Like, I don't know how to how to navigate that if you're running Twitter Spaces or you're running Clubhouse. And this is, by the way, it relates to why Substack is paying people is because the best shortcut to that is just to pay people who are really good <laughs> yeah. to like, you know start creating stuff here. So it's, I don't know, take it full circle. Did you guys look at um, um, the amazing, the crazy, epic, long Twitter thread yesterday that was that was published by Sean Pori about yeah. Clubhouse and the- When ultimate- it was a dozen tweets in and it was still just visualizing <laughs> how <laughs> exciting it must be to start Substat or started Clubhouse, I, I dropped off to be honest, but I, I was hoping someone would summarize it for me. So <laughs> what, what, did he, what, what was the point he ultimately got to? Um, <laughs> wow, you weren't on the edge of your seat. I, I told him like, if no. you just replace Paul with Harry Potter and publish this on Wattpad, this story would do really well. <laughs> <laughs> the hero's journey. Oh. Um, okay. So let me try and summarize it for you. Um, so, so basically this, this tweet thread, I wonder, is there a way for me to share it in this space? I have no idea. I'm not going to try and figure it out. Oh yeah, there was like, I heard in spaces, there was a thing where you can like kind of make a tweet, like a focal Mm -hmm. thing that everyone's looking at. I have no idea how to do it. Does anyone know? Maybe because I'm the admin, how do I adjust settings? Yeah, you're Um, the host. But while you do that, essentially there's like, he basically predicted that there's two strategies that Clubhouse is going to chase and both of them are going to result in dead ends. Um, And that those two strategies are one, to pursue really high quality content, like programmed content, like the kind of shows that we're doing and planning and scheduling guests for that draw in a ton of users, like like whenever they have Mark Zuckerberg in or Elon Musk or whomever, who is a huge focal point and, and drives a ton of audience and maxes out the room, like that's going to be the first strategy. And then the second strategy is going to be chilling, chilling with friends, like meeting people and just chilling there over audio and having like basically phone calls. Um, And the reason why both of these strategies were doomed, he said, was for the content strategy, audio content is really, really different than Twitch content. It's content that is being like, even the most engaged clubhouse hosts are probably broadcasting for one hour, maybe two hours a day max. It's not like a Twitch streamer who's literally playing this game as their full-time job for 12 hours a day, producing high quality content for their audience around the clock. And so as soon as like the content dries up, um, people are, are not going to come into the show. And if you missed like the critical part of a produced piece of content you've basically missed like the whole conversation or like it's not um like a conversation is not fungible like how you can drop in during a video game stream and really get the gist of it at any point in time Um, so you need something interesting happening at all times in order to make the app worthwhile um and then i just tweeted the thread i tweeted it at lee because i didn't want to like do like top level tweets so look at my like tweets and replies or whatever i just said this is the thread i just you know i don't want to endorse it it's a little as as a writer you know i'm just i gotta say it's a little self-indulgent i just a little self-indulgent sean i like sean i think he's a good writer it's just that thread was a little bit much yeah uh, so to anyway. continue my story, which is becoming a more long-winded version than his original tweet storm, um, essentially like under the content strategy, you're catering towards creators with a big audience. And so you need to build these power user features like scheduling, guest management, recording. And the minute you introduce like recording, people are no longer going to have a reason to come into the show. Like they're going, these power users will want to push the content out elsewhere. Um, and so that diminishes 
why people would come into the app and listen to it live. And then the second strategy of chilling um, isn't going to work, he said, because it'll have great retention, but poor growth because people don't want to chill with new people all the time. They want to chill with the people that they're already friends with. And people are very much of the mindset of no new friends. So there's not going to be a lot of growth under that strategy, even though it'll be sticky. And then at the end, he predicts that the founders are going to sell to Facebook for $90 $90 million, spend a year PMing Facebook audio before quitting and traveling across Southeast Asia, and then only vowing to work on enterprise SaaS for the rest of their careers. The end. Very, very invigorating. Turner, I'm curious what you think. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it was all good points. I've never been the founder of a social company. I think Sean has, right? So he probably can speak yeah. to that pretty well. Yeah. Yes. Bebo, I mean, I right? think yeah. one of the interesting things about something like like any live product and any more like asynchronous on-demand recorded product is like you don't have that problem of op- like having to fill the app with content every time of day. It's just like if you're making like a video app like TikTok, just get 24 hours worth of content on there every day or like an hour of new content every day or two hours of new content, no matter when people open it up, there'll be something interesting. Or like Spotify and audio, like Spotify, there's always new music. There's always new recorded podcasts versus Clubhouse. Yeah. You do have to figure out that it's almost like a liquidity problem. Like you have to get the liquidity high enough where you constantly got interesting things happening. Um, And yeah, if you miss it, you can't like go back like with anything that's recorded, like on demand, you start every podcast from the beginning. Yeah, you start every TikTok video, YouTube video from the beginning. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like you know, like TV or radio. I mean, it's like a I weird... think I shared the tweet. Did I share it? It's interesting. Oh yes! Oh my gosh! You did it. Worked. Wait, there's did someone DMing me with all these tips about how to use Twitter Spaces. They were the one who also told me how to turn off the sound effects and the captions. And wow, give this person a, a shout out. Yeah, Can you I get think a this out? person might be Jack's yeah. account. <laughs> I, I, I really? don't know how else anyone else would... wait are you being serious his name is com- I, am I allowed to reveal your identity <laughs> 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 um, once I get permission I'll, I'll give him a shout yeah throw their profile sure. up on the screen um, there for everybody to see <laughs> yeah <laughs> no but here's the thing I'm so curious what people think about this because um, the point you made in there about when they introduce recording features, will anyone even use it? It's so interesting to me because it feels like creators desperately want it and, and it would be really useful for creators. And, um, but I do think less people would show up live and yeah. more people, if, if you get a recording, you, then you can probably listen to it in a podcast, do whatever. Yeah. Maybe you're not listening to it in these apps. Um, I imagine they could introduce a recording feature that would make it like exclusive to the app, but you could listen to the recording in the app. So at least you're still using the app, but there's, it's almost like a prisoner's dilemma. Like if I'm Twitter spaces, do I introduce recording? It's, it's better for me if I do and clubhouse doesn't, but it's worse for all both of us. If we both do, you know, <laughs> shout out to compound two, four, eight, who is in the fourth row here <laughs> for being the, That's Jack's I think so <laughs> must be. Um, anyways, compound two, four, eight. Thank you for all of the Twitter spaces tips. Yeah. Thank you. Compound. Um, (laughs) cool. So, but yeah, I'm curious what y'all think will happen. Like, will they introduce recording? It seems like they will. They clubhouse in their like speaker, uh, it's applying to be, um, in the accelerator thing Mm -hmm. that they're doing. They said like, what features do you want? And one of them was like recording. So it's, seems like they're going to do that. I think so. There's a bit of a prisoner's dilemma here because Twitter has announced that they will introduce recording features into spaces. Um, I'm pretty sure they said that to natively record the conversations and release them as edited podcasts. And so if that's the case, I think Clubhouse will be forced to do that. Otherwise, the top creators are going to opt to do that. I feel like it makes sense. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, like, I feel like one of the really interesting things about Clubhouse is kind of the participatory nature. And same with Twitter spaces. Like, if you're in Clubhouse, you, you're you in a room. Like, let's just let's just say there was that room earlier. It was like, um, 
Zuck, Daniel Ack from Spotify, Toby from Shopify. And we're all like in the audience and we're like, we're sharing space with them. We're there. Like we're all in a room together. Like this is so cool. And you can also go up and like, and talk to them. And you're like, Hey, like I'm on the stage with them. Like, how cool is this? You can't do that if it's recorded. Like you can really only do that live. So like, I feel like that's kind of the part of the magic of clubhouse is like knowing that you're live sharing a space with these people. Because like, I remember when it first came out, it was like, (laughs) I think somebody was like, Naval's talking on clubhouse. And I was like, Whoa, cool. Like I've never, I've never like heard Naval talk like in real life before. (laughs) right? Like he's got his podcast and like, yeah, right. you know, it's like how to be rich, like how to build wealth, whatever the stuff he talks about, but he was talking about different stuff in this clubhouse room. And it was like kind of cool. And I remember even actually somehow I got like called up on into the, like on the stage and it was like just Naval and this person talking. And yeah. he was like, Oh, Turner, like go to the audience. Like, it's just us talking, like get out of here. And I, like I left and I like, tried to leave, <laughs> like go to the audience. And then I joined the room again to listen Wait, Naval told you to yeah, leave it was awesome. He said, yeah, it was like my second audience. day using I'm the speaking. app. It was so awesome. Yeah, like, and I tried to join. The most Naval and Yeah, and ever. I tried to like I tried to join again to listen and it put me right on the stage again. I was like, fuck, I'm out of here. Like I just quick close the app. I was like, I don't want to piss anybody off. Because it was like one of the first days of Clubhouse. And there was like every single person using the app yeah, was totally. on it at that point. So I was just like, oh man. Um, oh, Lee just got booted from spaces, she said. Interesting. Oh no! You missed my what? story about Naval. How that? <laughs> yeah. Well, here Lee is a listener. Invite to speak. Oh, I'm back. I'm back. Lee, welcome back. I don't what know. Happened? My app just crashed, and then the top oh, bar wow. would not load. I'm back. Cool. All right. Good. Whew. Did you miss the story about Naval telling Turner to be quiet? Um. <laughs> yes, I did. Did that actually happen? <laughs> Yes. So where, where did I lose you there? Um, you were just saying you had never heard Naval's voice before. Wait. <laughs> so I never like, you know, I like, I think this is hilarious, by the way. Like I, I have no, like, yeah. Me like, too. I, I find I, like, this incredible. I like had heard his podcast. I was like, this is, you know, he's talking about how to be rich and like build wealth, whatever, you know, like how to free yourself from the chains of like the nine to five job and stuff like that. But I remember like there was a night where someone was like, oh, Naval's talking. It was like the second night I was on Clubhouse or something. And I was like, oh, cool. Like I'll listen to it. And like somehow I got called up onto the stage with Naval. And I was like, oh, shoot. I didn't mean like, I don't know what happened. And Naval was like, oh, Turner, like, wh- what are you doing? Like, get, it's just us talking. Like, get out of here. Like, go, go back down or something. <laughs> and so I like try to leave. So I. Yeah, so I, like, I left the room and I tried to get back in to go in the audience and it put me back on the stage again. And I was just like, oh shit. I just like closed the app. Like I didn't use it again for an hour. I was just like gone because I was like, I don't know what to do. It was like the second day on the app. But that, so what I was getting to is that that doesn't happen when it's like recorded. Like it was such a magical <laughs> moment, right? <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. Like the whole thing was so funny. This yeah. is the core use case of the live <laughs> audio room to inform that is accidentally stage bombing while Naval is speaking. That is oh my God. the purpose. Yeah, no, I get it. Cause there, a lot of podcasts do record live. Like I, there's this podcast called accidental tech podcast and it's been around for like 10 years and I, it's like classic podcast kind of territory. Oh, nice. And like, I love it. And they record a show live every Wednesday. And the thing is I usually don't listen and I've wanted to listen. I actually have never listened live, but I always kind of want to, I'm a little bit like, it'd be fun to like be in a you know, chat room and stuff and, whatever especially if they made it a little bit participatory um like if you're willing to buy like a t-shirt or go to a live event you might be willing to like listen to a live thing yeah. you know like on on an app on your phone um and a lot of podcasts have sold a lot of tickets to live events and t-shirts and stuff so they probably sell many more um virtual event quote unquote t- scare quote tickets yeah and um, i feel like when you so. charge like if your monetization model if your clubhouse somehow involves live participation or like live listening or whatever. Like, I just feel like that's, excuse me, like that's the secret. That's the really hard thing to do. I mean, as a, somebody who invests in early stage consumer companies, I mean, it's been a lot of similar audio apps and none of them have gone anywhere near the magnitude of success the clubhouse has had, cause it's really hard. And like, they've basically built this up. Yeah. So. Hmm. 
Well, should we? I'm I'm kind of feeling that we should use the native functionality of uh, these live audio rooms and see if see if anybody wants to come up that we know. Yeah. That'd be fun. Get all into that. Yeah. Definitely. Share the stage. How do we do that? All right. So I'm going to end the the video portion of this. See you next week, video. See you guys.